Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful and thankful for your word, for your Holy Spirit who guides us and directs us. I ask that you would filter out all foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians verse by verse. We're still here. We were hoping we'd be gone by Feast of Trumpets. We were hoping we'd be gone by Atonement. We're now looking at Tabernacles, I consider the entire month of October, uh, a month to be watchful for. Uh, if not, we go into 2023. We continue, the, we stay the course, we continue. Uh, preaching the truth of God's Word, uh, which is really what I think it means to occupy until Jesus comes. There are many who need to hear the truth, and I'll have a special note about that uh, at the end of this video. We stopped at uh, the first couple of verses. We're in chapter 3. This is probably the most single important truth that you could ever hear in your entire lifetime as a human being. We, we are in the section of the gospel, probably the most important news that any human being on earth could ever hear and believe. That's where we're at. I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. That is the gospel, and nowhere in that is there any injunction, any command, any exhortation, any instruction, anything telling you to do anything. That's the first thing that we need to understand. The gospel is what Christ did, not what man must do. We tend to follow up behind that and we add something to it that is not there and we do that uh, based on a faulty assumption that only that is true if we of us if we do something to make it true i've spent a lot of time and hundreds of videos proclaiming the truth of god's word that's where we were at in context uh, we're not speaking a bunch of gibberish. We are actually proclaiming uh, the truth of God's Word. And it's so, it's, so it's no wonder that we go into this marvelous revelation of the doctrine of, the, of Christ uh, and what He's done for us, uh, that which we typically call the Gospel. And in our previous studies, we were looking at the importance of edification uh, that it's so that the body of Christ can be edified and built up in the knowledge of who Christ is and what He's done for us. And that through proclamation. We proclaim the truth. I think the best place to start out in all of this is who is Jesus? Because if we have the wrong idea of who Jesus is, then we are worshiping, serving, another Jesus, a Jesus other than the Jesus that the Bible talks about. Uh, it's extremely important that we understand just who Jesus is. Is it the Jesus of Scripture or is it some other Jesus? What we know is that God became incarnate in human flesh, that He was God's only begotten Son. Now, we know that Christ was eternal. Why does it say that God begat Christ when Christ was creator of heaven and earth? He, he, was, he, he spoke the worlds into existence. He never had an, a beginning. or He doesn't have a beginning or end. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the eternal God, and yet He's Christ, the Father's only begotten Son. Only begotten Son. You know, the word begotten, you know, begat, you know, uh, we, be, we, be, we beget children, uh, children are begotten, 
Uh, we, we bring forth children. Uh, it's the only answer that I can give anyone concerning the word begotten there is, is that isn't it amazing that God uses the term begotten concerning a person who's eternal? A person of the Godhead, the second person of the Trinity. The entire message, folks, toward us is one of birth, of new birth. He's God's only begotten Son. He came through a virgin birth. He was God Almighty, incarnate, in human flesh, and, and the Father begat the Son. We are God's children. He begat us. We didn't begat ourselves. We were born just as we're born with earthly parents, natural parents. We had no, no say so, no decision. We played no role whatsoever in our being born or, or our being conceived. Scripture is very clear on the fact that we're born again by the will of God, not according to the flesh, not according to the will of man, but of God. So as we go into this looking at the gospel, we need to make sure that when it comes to the most important thing that we could ever possibly talk about, that we get it right. That he was buried and he was raised from the dead. Now a lot of truth can, can, can be brought out concerning his burial. Uh, what did, what what, why is the nature of his burial included in the gospel? Why, couldn't God have just said, well, you know, the gospel is Christ dying for our sins and raising from the dead. Why, why include the burial? Why is the burial part of the gospel itself? I think it's because we've been buried with him in baptism, identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. There's enough evidence in Scripture to say that when Christ died, you died, and when He was buried, you were buried with Him, and when He was raised, you were raised with Him to walk in newness of life. So we could spend a lot of time on, the, on that, and we could spend a, lot of, a whole lot of time on the word resurrection. You know, just studying, I, could, we, I guess we could spend months studying His resurrection. I'm going to assume that most of the, my viewers that watch these videos believe that Jesus Christ was God Almighty, that He was crucified, that He was buried, that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He made an appearance to confirm the fact that He had raised from the dead. We are the elect of God. Scripture has to come into chapter uh, 15 here of 1 Corinthians all of Scripture to help support the message that's being presented. Uh, we can't abandon one truth over here, you know, and adopt one truth over here and abandon one truth over here and it not be consistent. Uh, Romans chapter 9 is a good example. There's a lot of other passages of Scripture. There's, there's Scripture on Him electing an entire nation. There's Scripture on Him electing us, choosing us, in Christ before the foundation of the world. It is very much a part of the gospel. It's not mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. Why? Why isn't all that doctrine mentioned here in a simple message concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ? That He, he, he lived, he, was die, he died, He was buried, raised again from the, from on the third day according to the Scriptures. Why doesn't it mention all of that wonderful truth concerning that? I don't think it has to. There's nothing in the, the gospel itself, the gospel message of itself, that's telling anyone what they got to do, what they should do, giving anyone any instruction on, on, on what they must do to make that effective in their lives. Christ came and died in the place of His own, a substitutionary death. We are the elect of God, we're the promised seed. We're children of promise, born of incorruptible seed, not of our earthly parents, our father, but incorruptible seed. Incorruptible. 
and it's by the Word of God that we're born again, and it's by the Spirit of God that we're born again, and I put out numerous videos on how we didn't have anything to do with any of that. We need to understand, though, that when He died, we died with Him. When He was buried, we were buried with Him. When He was raised, we were raised with Him. To walk in newness of life. Why does it say newness of life? Why does Paul use the phrase newness of life, or the Holy Spirit use that phrase? Because it's a, different, it's a way that, it, in, a, in a very strict manner of speaking, it's a way that's far different than our former manner of life in which we once walked, which was according to the flesh, in trying to please God and gain His favor based upon our human performance, our own performance. We live in a world where the world system is a system, it's a religious system, it's based on human merit, and that is what we're being saved out of, delivered out of. In fact, it's, it's, we see that in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that system, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then we make the who, whosoever be mean anybody. Anybody can believe. Now, if you, may, if you do that, folks, you, you've, you've just not been consistent with the rest of the Word of God. There can't be any inconsistencies. Christ came and died for His own people, His elect, chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, that's true whether they believe it, accept it, receive it, or anything. They, people have not always had the Word of God. Some people have, down through the ages have never heard of Jesus Christ, yet God had His own. In every age, in every dispensation, God has had His own people. And He's saved them, and He's delivered them, He's redeemed them from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, even and death itself. And He's done so through the finished work of Christ on their behalf. Because God is faithful toward His own. He has a family. And we love our families, and we wouldn't, we'd, we wouldn't dare think that anyone would, would, would think that we couldn't have a family. But we tend to think that God is not allowed to have a family of His own. And we get into passages concerning the wheat and the tare, the sheep and the goats, you know, the, the seed which he did not plant, it, plant, but he says an enemy hath done this. He didn't plant them. He didn't plant that seed. The enemy did that. And we're looking into spiritual realms which only we've been only granted a small part of vision to see. God knows his own. These are God's people. He's loved them. He's cherished them from before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world was ever laid. But there's, there's an amazing pattern here, folks, that I really want you to see. And I'm hoping that in this video, you'll come away from this seeing, and, and many, many of you out there love patterns. And this is why I'm gonna take the time to try to do this at least shed some light on this, what I believe is the greatest, single greatest pattern in all of the Bible. And that is the pattern of Christ in you. You being Christ's child. You know, we, we would almost have to start at the beginning uh, where that... Uh, it's... It's more than a series of patterns, folks. It's really, it's, it's, it's one single pattern that goes all the way through. We are the body of Christ. We're bone of His bone. We're flesh of His flesh. We're born again by God, by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God from above. It's a new birth. It's a quickening to life. It's a regeneration process that we had nothing to do with. If you believed, received, accepted, was baptized, repented, or did anything else, it was only because you were able to, because God made you able, and the way that He made you able was He, he quickens you to life. Because dead men can do nothing. Dead men can't believe, receive, repent, 
be baptized or anything else. It's foolish to think that a spiritually dead person can respond to God. He has to be made alive first. That's what the Word says. And when we look at the Gospel and what Christ did for us, it, is, it only makes sense in light of the fact that a dead man can't receive. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Lord because they're spiritually concerned, uh, discerned. We are uh, the body of Christ. We're told by the Holy Spirit through Paul that for me to live is Christ. Note, note the words here. This is not just sweet poetry, folks. For me to live is Christ. It's not for me to live is not myself. For me to live is not my own performance, not my own merit, not my own standing before God. For me to live is Christ. If you see Christ in me, or I see Christ in you, we're seeing the biblical picture that, that the Holy Spirit presents. Uh, it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. It is not I, but Christ, Paul says in Galatians 2.20. Uh, it is not I, but Christ. And yet, the majority position today among Christians, believing Christians, sincere believing Christians, who are no doubt headed for heaven, is, is that our lives are, it's, it's not Christ, but it's us. It's not Christ, but it's I. Not Christ, but I. They reversed it. Of course, Satan's reversed everything, just about. And the remarkable thing about it is, is that you can almost look at what the modern religious system based on human merit does today. And, and if you just reverse it, you're, you're pretty, going to pretty much be in, a line, in line with the truth. Satan's a, a master deceiver. He's deceived the entire world, folks. Don't think for one moment that modern Christianity today is, well, Satan's just not been allowed, you know, it's hands off. Satan can't touch it. Sa I don't know how to, to even put into words how, how much I believe Satan focuses on not the non-believer out here that's wandering around in the world that doesn't know God you know or, or anything else it's it's the it's the body of Christ the church in, in our present age that that he's out to destroy and of course the only way that he can do that destroy it at, at all he, well, he can't, tr he can't actually destroy the church, the body of Christ. But what he does is he, he destroys it in the sense that the church is lost, drifting on a sea of unknowing despair. Uh, doctrine becomes uh, uh, most hated word. Well, doctrine is divisive. Uh, we don't need all of this. We it, just love one another. You know, he's the master deceiver. Okay, he has made the church believe that they're in great standing before God because of all the stuff that they do. Why is it that we see the word not I, words not I but Christ? Why is it we read the words Christ manifest? Why is it we read the words we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of ourselves, and yet we go about trying to make it of ourselves. Why is that? Because of Satan. Satan has deceived us into believing. The modern church, actually it's not just today, it's, it's been this way ever since Christ left. Satan has been out to destroy the church doctrinally since from day one. We look in the Word of God and we see the words, the fruit of the Spirit. And we think we want to call it fruits, plural, and we want to attach those fruits to, to ourselves that we produce that fruit, even though John chapter 15 clearly, clearly explains that that's not the case. That He's the vine, that we're the branches, that apart from Him we can do nothing, that we don't produce any righteousness in and of ourselves, all righteousness is of the Lord. As, and as Paul says in Romans uh, chapters, chapters 2 and 3, 
or chapters, in especially chapter 5, it's the righteousness of God. It's based on faith. It's faith's righteousness. Not even our own faith, but the faithfulness of God. And yet we think that, well, we tend to want to give, give ourselves a nice little pat on the back because we feel like that we have, uh, you know, produced uh, fruits, you know, of the Spirit. And these fruits, you know, well, you can be... You can be exercising or practicing or manifesting one fruit of the Spirit. And, uh, and you, you kind of get that down. And then you go to the next one. You work on that one. And, you sort of, and you're working your way toward perfection here. And you go through all of these, these fruits of the Spirit. Well, this week I'm, I'm going to work on love. The next week I'm going to work on patience. The next week I'm going to work on this and that and the other thing. And we fail to realize this, this all comes in a nice, neat, little, beautiful package, folks. The fruit of the Spirit is singular. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit that produces the singular fruit of the Spirit. Listen to me. If one is not there, none are there. If just one characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit is not there, they're all missing. None are there. Because basically what we're looking at is we're looking at the Holy Spirit, the life of Christ, not I but Christ, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, which is perfect. It's lacking nothing. I, I think it's worth repeating. If, if there's one missing, none are there. Okay? If there's one there, they're all there. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Same with Christ. It's not Christ partly manifest. It's like, okay, well, half of me is Christ manifest and half of me is me manifest. It's, it's all or nothing. Could Jesus have sinned? That's, it's been an argument for centuries, for ages. That argument's been gone back and forth between yes, He could have, no, He could not have. It doesn't take a whole lot of study to realize, folks, that Jesus could not have sinned because He was God Almighty in the flesh. He didn't, he didn't have a nature inclined towards sin at all. It was impossible for Jesus to have sinned. So when He was tested in the wilderness, He was going to pass that test when He was tempted in the wilderness. He would have never gave in to Satan. Impossible. You're looking at God Almighty. So what was the whole thing about? I mean, why are we being shown that, that Jesus was tempted for 40 days in the wilderness? Well, He could have bowed down to Satan. He could have, you know, sought His own glory, His own, you know, plan, His own agenda. He could have, you know, been worshipped by everyone and, and you know, as... But he, he, he didn't give in. He, he was tempted. He, he could have sinned, but he didn't. He didn't. Folks, if you think that Jesus Christ, God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh, could have ever sinned, then you don't, you don't understand who Jesus was. He could not have sinned, and that is an important aspect of all this because we as new creations in Christ have a sinless new nature according to the Holy Spirit through John in the first epistle to John. We cannot sin. That new man, new nature cannot sin, has no ability to sin whatsoever because his seed abides in us and we cannot sin. The new man cannot sin. All the old man does is sin. The new man can't sin. Impossible. Can't happen. And most Christians are walking around today, sincere Christians, completely unaware of the fact that they have a new nature. They've been made a new creation in Christ. They have a new nature that cannot sin. And so they're operating, they're functioning, they're working in an area of their lives in which God is not, which is the flesh, and trying to make the flesh acceptable to God.
There's a pattern here, folks, that I want you to see. And uh, maybe it'll become more clear as we go through this. We looked at the role that the water, that is the Word of God, plays in redemption and salvation. And yet, the Word of God, doctrine, doctrine, is probably one of the most hated words uh, within Christianity today. And yet, it's the very Word of God, the water of the Word, that cleanses us, that, that saves us. It's the same when it comes to the role that the Holy Spirit plays in redemption. We've seen nothing in this study but the Holy Spirit actively at work in, the li in, in our lives, in the lives of these Corinthian believers, in guiding and directing them into all truth. That this was not Paul's Word. This is the Word of God. The, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who His whole entire purpose is to glorify Christ he didn't even tell us his name. You know, we know, you know, the Father has a lot of names. Jesus has a lot of names. The Holy Spirit, I'm sure, must have because he's a person, and yet he didn't even reveal to you and I his name. Why? Because his whole entire purpose is to glorify the Son, and if it and if it's not that's not being done, it's not of the Holy Spirit. I've uh, spent much time addressing the question of our standing before God, how that God looks when He looks down upon us, how does He see us? Does He see us as some hopeless case that, you know, where He's just hoping, wishing that we'll strike, get our act together and straighten up our, our act and, and fly right? I mean, is that, is, that, is that the God that we know and worship and serve? No. When the Father looks at, at you and I, folks, dearly beloved, when He looks at us, when our Heavenly Father looks down upon us, He sees us as righteous as His Son. Why? Because we're such good, great people? Because we're so righteous? Because we're so holy? Because we're, we're, we're just, a, man, we're just, we just got it, man, we just got it down. I mean, we've, He loves us because we just try so hard. He loves us because we just... You know, He feels so sorry for us. He pities us. You know, He loves us. You know, because, you know, and He's trying to give us every opportunity that we can to do the right thing and to say the right thing. And, and He's just up, to, He's this God that's up there. It's a God that's of, of most people's sordid imagination. And He's up there, He's just hoping and wishing, you know, that we'll be the kind of people that He wants us to be. That's not what I read in the Word. We have a standing before God. In theological terms, it's called positional truth. We have a position in Christ. We have a standing before God in Christ. And that position, folks, is different than our condition. Condition, okay? If we try to, to evaluate our position by our condition, we've greatly erred. You can't do that. You can't make a determination as to how we stand before God based upon our condition. First of all, we don't walk by faith, we walk by sight. He calls us brethren. Jesus Himself calls us brethren. Well, He calls us a lot of things. He calls us friend. He calls, but we're called brethren. Where his, he's not ashamed to call us brethren. The message that we preach. Is what Christ did for us. And it will encounter opposition every single time. You can't, you can't preach the gospel without seeing that same pattern that, ex, that exists between us and our Lord when He was confronted with opposition and when He spoke the truth. This is, this is what I find so amazing about it. Our lives literally mirror His in a very real sense with the exception that we're not God. When it comes to everything else, life, service, our conduct, our behavior, our message, our, our speech, 
our lives mirror his why. Why? Why is it? Why is it that uh, it, it mirrors our, our life and it, uh, to a great degree where the, uh, the opposition we encounter we see was the same that he encountered? That uh, it, in, this, in our spiritual life and service, uh, we see the same thing. In, in, in spirit and truth worship, we see the same thing. Why is that? Why does the world so much hate, hate any suggestion that would say that our relationship with God is not based on human merit? Why would the world hate that? Because that's what the world wants. That's what the world believes. That's what the world seeks. And we can talk about Arminianism and Calvinism all day long, but Arminianism, which is the predominant, basically the predominant theological view today, I would like for you to, uh, to at least give some thought to the fact that the entire system that believes that man is that that the entire religious system that believes that we earn favor with God by by our performance must have not read the book book of Galatians the epistle to the Galatians the entire epistle the the whole book was written to address that problem the problem that existed even in Paul's day it crept into the church early. I read that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, John 3, 6. 8, 3, 3, 6. Uh, that it's of His own will, He begat us. That's James 1, 18. Can't argue with that. Yet it's, that stands against the predominant message of conservative Christianity and non-conservative Christianity today. Not of any corruptible seed, such as is physical, but of an incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God, 1 Peter 1.23, germinated by the Holy Spirit in what can be described only as a form of virgin con conception, folks. The pattern, this is the pattern I want you to see. Jesus Christ was conceived of a virgin. We were born again of incorruptible seed. That pattern runs all through like a golden thread through Scripture, and it's a remarkable pattern. It's been said that we can, well, Steve, you can resist God's grace. No, we can't. That This process is irresistible because there's no one there prior to a person being quickened to life, that spiritually dead person, there's no one there to resist. It is a work of God, wholly of His initiation, without human consent or refusal. Now, the Lord's people may, in fact, play a part in it. Uh, because it's their privilege. It's our privilege to plant the seed. But the recipient of life plays no part in this process whatsoever. I think Psalm 80, verse 18, sets the sequence of events in, the, in their right order. Quicken us and we will call upon your name, and we shall be saved. No, notice what came first. New birth, new life, precedes all else. It must precede all else. It's that way in normal life. It's that way in, in, in our earthly life. It's that way in... In, in what we consider real life, it's that way in life itself. But, oh my, we, we, can't, uh, we can't have that order in the spiritual life. No, we have to put man first. We have to say that man must do something in order for God to quicken us to life. As, as if Lazarus had to do something for, for Christ to be able to say, Lazarus, come forth. You know, it wasn't, 
Lazarus come forth. It was important. It was Lazarus had to agree to it. He had to accept the fact. You know, when Jesus said, Lazarus come forth, Lazarus could have said, well, I don't want to. You know, or I, I you know, I could have made a decision as to whether or not to come forth or not. Salvation in the strictest sense of the, of the term, which means deliverance, it follows new birth. It follows regeneration. Deuteronomy 32.18, the rock who begat you, and he's talking about Israel here, you are unmindful. The Holy Spirit here in Deuteronomy chapter 32, the Holy Spirit is telling Israel that the rock who begat you, you've forgotten. And in our present text, we're told to keep it in mind, keep it in memory, don't forget Isaiah 66, shall a nation be born at once. John 1, 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Uh, John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Uh, James 1, 18, which I've already mentioned, of his own will, he begat us with the word of truth. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope. First, First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 Being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God. What is the result of all this? Okay, you want to be an Arminian? No, you want to be a Calvinist, okay? My question to you is, how many Arminians are giving God all the glory? Folks, if you can't give God all the glory, don't give Him any. You're just wasting your time. Dead people don't raise themselves from the dead. How modern Christianity has missed this, and they've had 2,000 years nearly to get it, is beyond me beyond my comprehension. They, dead people don't raise themselves from the dead or decide what family that they're going to be born in. God's grace is irresistible because you're His child, because He conceived you, because he chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Of course it's irresistible. You're His child. Just because you don't believe in all the grace that God's given you doesn't mean that He hasn't given it to you. If you could resist it, folks, if you could resist grace, well, it wouldn't be grace. And if you could abandon it all, just chuck it all, just throw it all away, you'd be more powerful than God. I know of a brother that I came to love here recently. I've only, only got a, the privilege, the opportunity to know him for several years. He lived his entire life, according to my understanding, he lived his entire life basically under law. And all the time he knew something wasn't right. And he had the marvelous privilege to go home and be with the Lord after coming to understand after all those years that it was Christ in him, the hope of glory. I had the privilege of meeting him and his wife several times. My, me and my wife, we met them. Not too many of our followers will take the time to come and visit us. But that's that's not an indictment. That's just, I mean, it's just a fact. It's an understandable fact. Uh, you know, it's a very unique circumstance. 
that our God allows us to experience like this where that there's little to no real personal contact between brethren, brothers and sisters, but there's so strong an attachment that it makes it solemn and it makes it special. Our lives are entwined with one another and we've, we've, in most cases, we've never even met. You know, it's, it's one thing to go to church on Sunday and meet all your friends and you know them and, and you, you've lived with them, you grew up with them, maybe you went to grade school with them. And, you know, that's, that's one thing. But to love someone so much that you barely that you hardly know only because of what Christ did for us Look, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm just sort of rambling. I'm going to stop right here. We'll pick up at probably verse 5 next video. I love you all. I truly do. Uh, thank you for all your prayers. Uh, please pray. Continue to pray for the victims of the, of the Hurricane Ian. Please continue to pray for the direction of this ministry. And if you wouldn't mind, take a special moment to say a prayer for... Uh, one particular family, their name I uh, won't mention. I don't, I'm not in the habit of doing that, but they've recently lost a loved one. They could use your prayers for comfort and support at this time. Uh, we lost a dear brother named Jeff. Uh, just pray for him and his family. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.